five minutes. Secretary, pleasure to um, see you here today. Um, do you agree that we have a, um, a crisis on the southern border? Yes or no? Congressman, we have a, a very serious challenge, and I don't think the difficulty of that challenge can be overstated. Uh, we also have a plan to address it. Uh, we are uh, executing on our plan, and we will succeed. That's what we do. Okay. Uh, and it's for the very said, reason. Um, and, it's for the okay. very reason, if I may. I apologize. It's for the very reason of which I spoke a moment ago. Okay. Of extraordinary um, you, you men said, and women. Mr. Secretary, you said that um, to uh, Congressman Swalwell, you said that you consider COVID to be a threat to our homeland, um, and a, a serious threat, I assume. Is that correct, Congressman? The pandemic is a is a threat. Uh, not only to our country, it is a threat um, uh, that we are tackling like never before. Okay. It's a threat uh, throughout the world. All right, but thank the, you. The Congressman thank Swalwell's you. question, I think, spoke to biological threats writ large, something that we in the Department of Homeland Security have historically addressed, thanks to Congress and the creation of an office that is thank specifically you. Thank you, Mr. focused on it. Um, do you agree that U.S. citizens must present a negative COVID 19 tests taken within three days to enter the country after flying internationally. Do you, do you agree with that statement? Yes or no? I believe we require uh, a, a negative uh, test for individuals traveling uh, uh, internationally. Okay, great. Um, yet there are thousands of foreign nationals that cross our borders and that are released into our communities um, <clears throat> without us knowing if they've had a COVID 19 test or not, whether they test positive or whether they test negative. So there appears to be a more lenient standard for foreign nationals crossing our border illegally than for American citizens. So why is that? That is not true. What do you mean it's, it's not, not true? true? It's unequivocally uh, not true for the reasons I've expressed. So, so are we testing every, uh, excuse me, are we testing every um, a uh, foreign national that crosses our border to see whether they have COVID or not? It is our policy, as I have articulated before, Congressman, it is our policy to test individuals who are apprehended in between the ports of entry, to test them, and if in, the, if in fact they test positive, to quarantine them. That is our policy, and we have built practices to execute on that policy. So can you assure the American people that no one who has been apprehended um, is released into our communities with uh, that still test positive for COVID-19? Um, uh, Congressman, let me be, be, let me be clear. Uh, there were times earlier when individuals um, were apprehended and we sought to expel them, and we were unable to expel them, and we were compelled to release them, and we did not have the opportunity to test them. We have addressed that situation. So, so right now, as we speak right now, you're telling me that no one is released into our country that is uh, COVID-19 positive. Congressman, uh, allow me to repeat myself if I may. Well, that's just a yes or it no is, question. Just yes, yes or no. No, no it's... Um, Congressman, if I may, uh, the situation uh, at the border is complex and the complexity is evidenced by the questions I've been receiving throughout the morning. So please, if I may, it is our policy to test and to quarantine. Okay, we but are you executing to that policy 100%? We are doing the best we can to ensure that the policy is executed 100% of the time that I can say. Okay, the best we can. So it is still po it is still possible then for COVID nineteen uh, or for for um, foreign nationals who test positive for COVID nineteen to um, enter our country. Is that that's what you're saying? I guess, Congressman, we do the best we can in everything that we do. Okay, <clears throat> all right. Um, since the Biden administration took office, thousands of 
people have been released into the border communities. According to media reporting, since January 25th, 2021, at least 108 migrants tested positive for COVID-19 after being released into Brownsville, Texas community, where they proceeded to travel to cities throughout the United States. The mayor of Yuma, Arizona, told reporters that migrants are not being tested for COVID-19 before being released into his community, despite assertions made by the administration. And I just heard what you said. So <clears throat> is it the federal government's job to enforce our laws and not burden states with a public safety crisis resulting from federal policies? Um, Congressman, it is our responsibility to enforce uh, federal law. And um, the situations of which you spoke are precisely the situations uh, uh, that I provided in my answer to your prior question. There were instances in which individuals were released. Uh, and you mentioned Brownsville, and that is uh, an example of that. Uh, in Yuma, Arizona, uh, we didn't have the relationship with community-based organizations. They did not have the same footprint. And it is precisely why we built the additional practices to which I referred earlier uh, this morning why we've built different practices uh, to uh, plug any hole to ensure that our policy to the best of our abilities, our policy that everyone is tested and quarantined as needed, um, and that is what we have done. What we do is we address a challenge. And if we see an element of that challenge that we are not addressing, then we know what we must do and we do it. And that is precisely what we have done here and across the board in addressing um, uh, the migration of individuals at our southwest border. Gentlemen's time has expired. Right. Chair recognizes. I'll follow up on what you just said a moment ago. The first chairman to whom uh, the secretary referred to a, a moment ago said yesterday there should be mandatory cybersecurity standards for pipelines. Do you agree? And is this administration going to try to put those in place? So th our conversations within the administration are ongoing and have been underway with respect to what measures we need to take, both administratively and, uh, uh, of course, in a companion effort, uh, the legislature to see how we can raise the cyber hygiene across the co country. Yeah. Uh, on a separate issue, Secretary Mayorkas, we have cameras today in Texas that are showing humongous groups of dozens or hundreds of migrants walking right into the country. So I'm curious what you meant last week when you said the border is closed. Uh, the board, what I meant is um, uh, precisely that. The border is closed. Uh, we are expelling uh, single adults and families under the Title 42 authority that rests with uh, the Center for Disease Control. Uh, I, and uh, we decided as an administration, in furtherance of the president's direction, to administer our immigration laws of this country in an orderly and safe and humane way that we will not expel unaccompanied children. Mary. Secretary Mary, uh, Ranking Member Portman, you're recognized for your questions. <clears throat> Thank you, Chairman. You know, I said at the outset, I hope that we can kind of move on from the debate about the crisis and what happened and how we got here. But um, I have a lot of respect for you, as you know, Mr. Secretary, but um, I, I'm, I'm not able to sit here and, and not comment on this idea that somehow this is Donald Trump's fault. Um, I mean, you can say that the Trump administration should have been letting children in, but you have said instead you think it was inhumane what they were doing by turning children away based on Title 42, which said basically during the COVID-19 period, we weren't going to let folks in. And, and so if that's fine, we, we can have that debate. But you can't say that <laughs> and then also say, and the Trump administration is at fault because they didn't prepare for the surge. You're saying they didn't allow children to come in because they, you know, believe that under Title 42 they shouldn't come in, as well as adults and families. Therefore, kids didn't come up to the border. They didn't make that arduous journey from Central America. And then at the same time say they're at fault because they didn't prepare for the HHS facilities that they knew were necessary. They didn't know they were necessary because the, the, the kids weren't coming in. These are the facts. These are the charts, okay? I mean, let's just, let's just stipulate this so we can move on and talk about policy. And this chart is very clear. You see where the yellow line is. That is the Biden administration inauguration. Actually, I was generous. That yellow line should be one bar to the left. I gave, I gave uh, kind of the whole situation a month to kind of percolate so people would know 
in Central America and elsewhere what was going on. Here's January 21st, this bar right here. Look at that surge. I mean, it's obvious what happened. And, and you've said it. You said they weren't, you know, allowing unaccompanied kids or families or individuals to just come into the border and then go into the interior. They, they stopped that practice, and it had the intended effect. People stopped sending their kids up to Central America, paying smugglers, paying traffickers. Those kids, as we've said, facing all kinds of assaults and exploitation. And uh, so, you know, we can, we can agree to disagree on what the policy ought to be going forward. I get that. But let's at least stipulate as to what happened here. And what happened is when the Biden administration came in, they made a decision. You were asked to implement it. I remember talking to you at the time, and, and you realized this was going to result in some real issues. But the thought was, this is the humane way to go. Let's allow these kids to come in. And uh, so don't blame the previous administration for not having facilities that, that they didn't need because they didn't have the surge. Again, let's look at the numbers. So here we are. What do we do is the question. And for these kids, you had said earlier about the trauma some of them have faced and the difficulties that, that their families face in Central America. I get that. If I was a dad in Central America, I would want my kids to have a better life. And as I've talked to children and families on the border, both on our most recent trip and previous trip, you know, they all say the same thing to me, which is they do want their families to have a better life. Uh, these kids say they, they've come here to have a the opportunity to have a, a life where they can not just make more money, but have a, you know, a life in the United States of America because it's a better place to live. I get that. And I'm all for legal immigration. And I'm all for providing asylum to people who really have a credible fear of persecution. But what we have done instead is just open the doors. And I would make the point that those children who came in 2019 during the last surge, I would ask you, Mr. Secretary, those children were allowed to come into the interior of the United States with sponsors. Some of those sponsors were unscrupulous, as we know, and we've done investigations on this and had hearings on this, and some of these kids were exploited. Some were not. But of those children who came in in 2019 who did not receive asylum because they didn't meet the criteria for asylum, how many have been deported and sent back to their home countries? Uh, Ms. Uh, Mr. Ranking Member, may I comment? Yes, yes, sir. But I would like an answer to that because I think it's, it's illustrative of, of where we are now that you look at your own ICE deportations in the month of April, I'm told they were at an historic low, that people are not being sent back even if they do not receive the asylum. Only 15 percent of individuals from Central America, I'm told, you can correct me, are successfully adjudicated. In other words, successfully having claimed asylum, receive asylum. And my understanding is there is no process in place to send those other folks back to their country of origin. So surely these smugglers have the opportunity to tell these families in Central America, give your child to me and that child will get into the United States and indefinitely um, will be able to stay there. So that's, a, that's just the policy we need to look at and we need to change. But could I, could I hear your answer on the 2019 surge and whether, how many of those children have been sent back to their home country? Mr. Ranking Member, um, uh, assuredly we'll have the opportunity to um, uh, discuss the many issues that you have raised. It will take me quite a bit of time to answer them fulsomely, but I will do so in bullet point fashion as rapidly as possible. First of all, uh, my parents brought me here to this country so that my sister and I could have a better life. So I'm very familiar uh, with the uh, challenges that we are addressing and more powerfully and heartbreakingly uh, the challenges that the parents are facing when they send their children uh, to traverse Mexico to reach our southern border. Secondly, um, we speak of lawful pathways and support of them, and yet the prior administration tore those down too. They tore down the Central American Miners Program that provided a lawful pathway 
for the adjudication of children's rights to um, arrive here in the United States and stay in the United States under the laws that Congress passed, but that was torn down. Mr. Secretary, Thirdly, can I just, just for a second, before we just continue the, the blame game here, how many children were processed over a three-year period through that program, which I support, by the way, and I support reinstating it? That, that program should have been built up rather than torn down. Well, how many, how many children were, during the Obama administration were brought in under that program? I would be pleased uh, to provide that data. Yeah, I think it's about 5,000 children, yeah. 5,000 children. Look at these numbers over three years. So I, I support that program. But let's not, you know, think that these are going to solve the problems that, that we face. Anyway, please, please, please continue. Um, that's 5,000 children that were expelled. Um, next, uh, I do not think that the prior administration supported legal immigration. They threw up every obstacle possible uh, to permit legal um, immigration. Fourth, uh, the asylum system um, is in need of improvement. It is in need of strengthening, and that is precisely what we are dedicated to achieving. It has been a years-long challenge preceding the Trump administration, preceding the Obama administration, that the time of adjudication of asylum claims is too long. We need to, we need to shorten that, but not at the expense of permitting individuals to develop their legitimate claims through the recovery from the trauma that they might have suffered, and so many, in fact, have suffered. And lastly, with respect to our enforcement efforts, we are focused on enforcing the law and focusing on individuals who pose the greatest threat to public safety, national security, and border security, and that is what we are executing upon, just as I did as a federal prosecutor for 12 years in a jurisdiction of approximately 18 million people with limited resources, we said we're going to allocate those resources to have the greatest public safety impact. I'm proceeding no differently as the Secretary of Homeland Security. Thank you, Secretary Mayorkas. I appreciate it. Uh, Senator, Senator Langford, you are recognized for your question. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Secretary Marcus, thanks for being here. The last time you were here, several months ago, during the uh, process of the nomination, I asked you about the border wall. You said you were studying that, would study it. I understand the administration called for a study that complete, was completed the 21st of March. None of us have seen the results of that study. Though there was a press release that came out of your office saying that they we're now protecting the border communities from the wall uh, at this point. When I was down at the border area, you've been down there as well a couple of times. Thanks for doing that. In Arizona, this is what I saw. Uh, the day that border wall construction stopped, miles and miles of wall with the gates incomplete, this seems to be the status that we're still at. This is nonsensical. As you know, the Border Patrol now has to park a vehicle right there next to that gap because on the other side of this fence is a city of 450,000 people on the, on the Arizona, from the Arizona side into Mexico. So my question to you is, what's the results of the study on the border wall completion? There's $1.4 million that was passed with a bipartisan majority last year that is in the law to be able to complete this. Where is this going? Uh, thank you, Senator. Um, two things, if I may. Number one, um, we have uh, committed uh, to finishing the levy, uh, the levies, as well as addressing uh, the erosion of land under roads adjacent to the wall as two public health imperatives. We have made that decision. And we are studying the very issue that you identify here about how are we going to address what is the most effective way to address uh, gates and the completion of gates as well as the closing uh, of gaps. That is something that is under review now. So this requires a review to be able to evaluate if you should just hang the gate when the steel is sitting right there, if that should be complete? Uh, the review is indeed underway. What what would be the challenge here? I, 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 I would tell you people at in my state, and myself included, when I went and looked at it, I don't understand what needs a review to be able to evaluate if you just have to be able to close the gate, especially when the law already has set aside those dollars and it's already there. Let me, let me follow up on a couple of things. You'd, you'd given testimony about the notice to appear. We understand there's been 19,000 individuals that have crossed the border this calendar year that were not given a notice to appear. Are you saying that's incorrect? Um, Senator, I'm not aware of that number, but let me, uh, if I may, say that it is our policy to issue a notice to appear, 
to individuals who are permitted entry into the United States to make their claim. Um, uh, ideally, they are issued the notice to appear at the Border Patrol Station. If we are not able to do that, the objective is to issue them a notice to appear at the Immigration and Customs Enforcement Office, right. uh, office to which they are directed. There was a time uh, when we were unable to issue certain notices to appear um, and place those individuals immediately in immigration proceedings. So but our understanding our is from being down in Texas, in Arizona, talking to some of the folks on the ground, we have the number of 19,000 individuals have been released in the country without a notice to appear. They're told to go to an ICE office wherever they're going in the country to self-report at the ICE office, basically turn themselves in there at ICE and ask for a notice to appear. Do you know of any that have actually done that? Do you have a number of 19,000 that have been asked to do that? How many have actually done that? Uh, I can get that number to you because we have seen a high rate, and I should say, I should say that individuals do not, who do not appear are a priority of ours for apprehension in the service of border security. So I understand those are family units that are coming in, uh, or it's a parent with a child, uh, at least one child at that point, they're told to be able to do that. Are the notice to appears that are being given out right now, do they comply with the previous Supreme Court orders that have been done to be able to make sure that they're consistent and they will stand up under the rule of law? I, I, believe, they, I believe they do, and I will confirm that, Senator. Please do, because we have several Supreme Court rulings recently that have given greater clarity to those NTAs. I want to make sure that we're actually not giving us something that will violate the court in that. Speaking of court, there was a court order that was done from George uh, Tipton about the moratorium. A uh, 100-day moratorium was announced to not deport individuals, even if a court had said they have a final order of removal. Uh, the Biden administration announced that. A federal court in Texas immediately said, no, you can't just do that. In the meantime, since that's occurred, if I'm tracking this numbers correctly, ICE removals have fallen anyway by 50 percent from January to April of this year and by 70 percent from October to April of this year. So I, I want to ask you, are you complying with the federal court order that ruled that you can't just stop? You have to continue to be able to remove people that have a final order of removal. Uh, we, we are complying with the, uh, with the court order. Um, Senator, it was the policy was promulgated uh, at the outset that there would be a pause on removals to enable the administration to review the policies. The court did, in fact, enjoin that pause and the pause was indeed lifted, and um, new guidelines uh, were issued. It's a pretty stark drop in removals, though. It's already happened this year. Uh, I also, uh, the, the policy seems to be for ICE removals and for enforcement priorities that it, it seems to be pretty high criteria at this point for removal of individuals. And if they're not on the predetermined list to be able to be removed, they have to go get permission in advance to be able to remove someone. I informed my staff on April the 8th of this year that enforcement action directed at sex offenders that do not meet the aggregated felony criteria will require pre-approval from the field office director or special agent in charge. So my question is about this. Can you share with us, say, the number of sex offenders that ICE has declined to deport this year because they did not meet that criteria? Um, uh, it is um, uh, my view uh, that individuals who commit uh, sex offenses uh, should be um, apprehended uh, and removed. Why is there a special request to get pre-approval before you actually address that? Um, Senator, allow me to um, explain the process because I have yet to issue my uh, enforcement and removal priorities and I intend to do so after engaging with the ICE workforce, hearing from our personnel uh, on the front lines as well as other stakeholders. Well, I, I would tell you there is a real concern about the, the additional hoops that people have to go through, which seems to discourage them, and we see that in the numbers, they 50% drop. Let, let me ask about Title 42, because when I was at the border, uh, that was a major concern of folks on what to do on Title 42. You and I spoke about this last time that you were here, saying that you're going to study it and try to examine what to do on this. There's a significant number of people, in fact, of the 178,000 people that were encountered at the border last month, 111,000, almost 112,000 of them were turned around due to Title 42. The question is, how are you examining what's your criteria for dropping Title 42 and what's your plan? Because if you drop Title 42 at this point, there's 112,000 more people that are actually engaging across the border. Senator, Title 42 
uh, is the CDC's public health authority. Correct. It is not a tool of immigration. It is a tool of public health. And therefore, the use of Title 42 will be governed by the CDC's analysis of the public health imperative. But is that the public health imperative in Mexico or in the United States? It is the public health imperative with respect to the protection of the American people. So that would be where they're coming from, from uh, they're coming across the border from Mexico, the health status there. I, I can't speak to the uh, precise uh, analysis that the, that the CDC uh, undertakes, um, and I'd be very I'll pleased follow to follow up with Please you. Please do. Mr. Chairman, thank you for the additional time on that. This is a very important issue that we started a couple of months ago that we still have to get clarity on how that's going to be handled, because this is a very serious issue of how those individuals that are currently being returned, what happens next? Thank you. Thank you, Senator. Thank you. Uh, of the 1.7 million people who've come here illegally, how many of them have been released into the country? Um, Senator, um, I can break that down to the best of my ability. Nearly 1 million, approximately, I would say 965,000, have been subject to expulsion under Title 42 of the United States Code. Okay, that gives us how many left? I, I believe approximately 40,000 have been removed under our immigration authorities uh, that we in the Department of Okay, Homeland slow Security. down. Where that gets us to like 840,000 people? No, no, no. Approximately 965,000 okay. were expelled. Okay. Approximately 40,000 have been removed. Approximately 125,000 thousand unaccompanied children have been transferred to the custody and the shelter of Health and Human Services. Um, the balance are, to the best of my knowledge, in immigration enforcement proceedings where... So what does that leave us? How many people are still here? Of the 1.7 million... How many people are still here? I would estimate approximately 375,000 are still here. here. Yes. Okay. Sir. That is my best estimate. Do you believe, vote. right, do you believe that if you have an immigration hearing and there's a final order of deportation, that person should be removed? I do. Okay. Why is one million people still here after they get a final order of deportation. Um, uh, Senator uh, Graham, as I uh, responded to- well, Is the system working? Oh, the, the immigration system is broken, has been broken- Well, let me just say this. It's really broken if a million people have been ordered to leave and they haven't left. Do you believe that the Remain in Mexico policy instituted by the Trump administration is cruel? Uh, as it was implemented, I do. Do you support permanently doing away with the Remain in Mexico policy? I do. Do you think that will increase illegal immigration if we do? Um, I do not because of the other efforts that we have underway. Secretary Mayorkas, you testified several times that our immigration system is, quote, fundamentally broken. True or false, under President Trump, we saw the lowest rate of illegal immigration in 45 years. Um, I don't know if it's uh, within 45 years, but we certainly saw in 2020 uh, a low level uh, of illegal immigration. 2019 uh, was very uh, okay. true, high. True or false, Secretary Marcus, this year under Joe Biden, we've seen the highest rate of illegal immigration in 61 years. Again, I don't know the number of years, but it's certainly a historic high, Senator. So you're right, it's broken, but you broke it. Let me ask you, in the calendar year 2021, how many illegal immigrants do you expect to have crossed illegally into the United States? I believe the, um, the total number of encounters has been referenced in this hearing earlier is um, uh, approximately just under 1.7 million. But there's two months remaining. Is it correct that you project over 2 million illegal immigrants in 2021, calendar year 2021? I believe that is correct, Senator. And over the last three months, we've seen a drop in the numbers by reason. And, and how many children do you project in 2021? I'm sorry? How many children will have crossed illegally in 2021? Um, I believe that thus far through October 31st, uh, Senator, approximately 125 
5,000 unaccompanied children have been transferred uh, to the shelter and care of Health and Human Services. Now, you told another senator you don't know how many gotaways there have been? Uh, I will have to circle back, uh, Senator, with that information. Yeah. So that wasn't a fact that, that you thought was relevant to this hearing? Oh, it is um, uh, absolutely uh, uh, relevant. I, I understand why the question is posed. It's a fact of great... Okay, you, but you're not prepared to answer it. How about this? How many deaths, how many illegal aliens have died crossing illegally into the United States under Joe Biden's administration? I don't have that data. Uh, so, the, so the deaths, you didn't prepare that data? Um, I'm about to run out of time. Our um, Vice President Harris, our border czar, what kind of grade would you give her? Vice President um, Harris is not the border czar. Vice President Harris has been uh, asked by the President of the United States to focus on root causes. Okay, let me answer this quickly in my last few seconds. When was the last time you talked to her about, about uh, securing the border? Several weeks ago. Okay. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I'm Thank you, Senator Kennedy. On time. I want you to recognize that. I sure do. You get an A plus, Senator thank you. Booker. Yeah. Thank you very much for being here, Secretary Mayorkas. I want to thank you and the incredible uh, professionals, thousands of work under your command, and thank them for their work and their dedication to our country. I want to start off by looking at the American food system, which is savagely broken. It's hurting everybody from driving record, uh, incredible, staggering numbers of independent family farmers out of business. It's hurting the end users. We're a nation where just 2% of our ag subsidies go to 